Typically, you would think a match like Blood and Guts or even the Stadium Stampede would be the end of a rivalry, like the one we have between the Inner Circle and the Pinnacle. But it seems like those two matches have only escalated the hostilities between these two groups. The Inner Circle demolishing the Pinnacle limousine. This is our property. This is illegal. I don't know if you can call it ego between Jake Hager and Wardlow, but I think you can call it pride. Now I dare you to fight me in the one place I have never been beaten, an MMA cage fight. You can throw away the pinnacle, you can throw away the inner circle as far as the meaning of this match is concerned, but you can't throw away the fact that these two have something to prove. Every fight, every match, I bring out the absolute best in you. You're gonna find out. It doesn't matter if it's in this ring, a freezer, a football field. When you're standing across from me, you're always in Wardlow's world. This cage fight with MMA rules will be three five-minute rounds, a 45-second rest period between rounds. Inside the MMA cage, it's only knockout, tap out, or TKO. This is a six-sided ring with chain link fence, no ropes, and nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. There's no escape. Oh, they rocked each other's jaw. This is a rivalry within a rivalry, but it's one that's been brewing for months now, maybe even years. This match will be a cage fight, but if you look back at AEW's history, no man is more experienced inside a cage in AEW than Wardlow. He faced Cody Rhodes in the first ever steel cage match in AEW in Atlanta, Georgia. He took part in the big pinnacle versus inner circle blood and guts match, two rings enclosed in a steel cage. And now Jake Hager challenging Wardlow to a cage fight. This might actually favor Wardlow. He's big, he's athletic, he's nasty, and he's smart. Well, as we know, Wardlow had beaten Jake Hager before in a wrestling match, but now we get into this cage fight at MMA rules, and does that win by Wardlow give him any sort of advantage in this match? And the answer is no. Jake Hager has certainly made a name for himself in a very short time in MMA. That does not concern Wardlow. He is more than willing to step up to the challenge to prove to Jake Hager that you are not the only big guy who can be successful in a cage fight. 6'6", 270, Hager's got to be the most accomplished striker of the two. Jake Hager, as a fighter outside of AEW, an undefeated record. Two stoppages via submission, one decision victory. Jake Hager has not lost inside the cage. Even though Wardlow has the big match experience, the cage match experience here in AEW, inside an MMA ring, inside an MMA cage, is a completely different world, and a world that I think favors Jake Hager. Jake Hager is as bad as they come, I promise. How can you go against someone who is undefeated in MMA? How can you do that? I, I don't think you can. I, as great as Wardlow is, and I know he can take punishment, I, I, I'm gonna go with Jake Hager. I think next week, Brock is gonna show the world he wasn't just born on third base, he's indeed going to steal home plate. It is in ungodly standards that some of these dads have set for us. If anyone can do it, I think Brock Anderson could do it. Talk about Orange's legacy. Of course I can talk about Orange's legacy. I can talk nonstop about it. We broke into the business about the same time, and I knew immediately that Arn Anderson had something special, not only because of the Anderson name and the legacy, but because of one, his ability to talk, of two, his ability to wrestle, and three, he quickly became a champion. Whether it was as a singles competitor, a tag team wrestler, part of a faction, Arn Anderson has done it all, and he has succeeded doing it all. My history with Arn Anderson, we're the greatest tag team that ever lived. That says it all. People love Arn because every time he went to the ring, he gave 100% and you knew the match that you were gonna get 
was gonna be one of the greatest matches you've ever watched. No matter how much praise he gets, because you're never gonna hear somebody speak bad about Arn. You're never gonna hear somebody say that he wasn't good in the ring. Everybody knows how good Arn is and he's still underrated. That's Arn's legacy. No matter how much praise he gets, he's always gonna be underrated because he's that good. I was actively retired in 97 from being a wrestler. So as Brock was growing up, he knew me as a producer. He knew me from that perspective, but the schedule didn't change. I was gone for everything. When I was home, I devoted all of my time to my family. I think knowing that I wrestled amateur in high school, played football, he kind of fell in line with that. Just out of the blue one day, he said something about wrestling. And I just said, what's your interest? He said, what would you think about me becoming, you know, a wrestler and following in your footsteps? The fact that I had never discouraged or encouraged, it kind of took me a little bit aback. I said, well, and after you graduate, you know what? We'll see. If you still want to do it, I'll help you all I can. So I got a call from Arn Anderson, and he asked me if I would come to Charlotte, North Carolina to work with his son, Brock. It was a dream for me. So I drove down to Charlotte, and I uh, tried this kid out, and man, he's, uh, he's the real deal. You can see the mannerisms. You can see the things that you can't teach that, that are just genetic. They're in your DNA. There's things there that the enforcer does that they're bred into him. He's going to be dangerous. What better family to come from than an Anderson family? You know, his son's got to live up to that for sure. That will be some personal pressure that he takes on himself. Any second generation wrestler, they have a lot against them. Not necessarily as far as what happens in the ring, but what happens backstage. When Brock steps into the ring against someone, someone's gonna say, okay, he's not gonna make a name for himself. He's not gonna establish a legacy at my expense. This is about him. It's not about me. Brock knows that he's gonna be under a microscope. The mistakes are his to make and his only. I just wanna tell him, cause we don't have this conversation. No expectations. You do your best. I don't care if you win. I don't care if you lose. You get in there and attack, and I'm very sure we'll all be smiling in about 20 minutes after that match starts. I've always wondered, can a Rhodes trust an Anderson? That's a tough question. I would say, um, don't know. Can the, can, that's a good question. Can a Rhodes trust an Anderson? I've been around long enough to know that time heals all. Cody, by taking this on, is taking a chance. He's taking a gamble. There's no one in that locker room I would trust more that things get rough and Brock gets in a pinch. That's the guy I'd want standing in that corner. There is a generational bond that has formed and just taken on another layer. The Rhodes and the Andersons have been around since the 70s, and they've been participating and thriving in this industry right up until this day. And when Brock debuts, that's another generation. There is a reason I picked this handicap match. Sky and Ethan, you say I need Sting. No, that's not what this is about. You guys, you guys need each other. Sky, this past year in the backstage, what did you do? Sat on your ass, crying and just hoping for a handout. What happened when you won the ladder match? You faced me for the TNT Championship. I showed you really quick that you did not belong. And Ethan, everybody knows our history. So that's what you guys have in common, huh? The hatred for Darby Allen. I can respect that. It's funny, because you talk about mental wounds, far worse than physical. You took away the TNT Championship. Now it's my turn. I'm gonna take away the number one thing that you guys hold dearest. And that's your pride. How are you gonna look at yourselves 
when the two of you lose to me.